The image is one that seems the stuff of campy science fiction. Nazis working tirelessly to make an arcane, magical weapon that will deal a decisive blow to the Allies and secure German domination over the world. And that is why the Third Reich will triumph, Blaskovitz. We are willing to risk everything to win. Many have thought this device would tear the barrier between our dimension and the Black Sun. But we persevered and now possess an inexhaustible source of power. With it, the Nazi war machine will conquer the world. Though the gulf between the truth of Nazi science and utter fiction is vast, there is indeed something to this familiar trope. Much of the intelligentsia of the Third Reich was obsessed with merging science and the occult. Heinrich Himmler, the Reichsführer of the SS and primary organizer of the Holocaust, had a personal astrologer and urged German scientists to research such resoundingly unscientific topics as witchcraft, devil worship, and the Holy Grail. Himmler moved the headquarters of the SS to Castle Devilsburg in 1933, right after the Nazis seized power. The castle, a massive, brooding 17th century masterpiece, was prized by the SS because of its purported spiritual power. The castle is located close to the site where the Teutonic tribes dealt a crushing blow to the invading Roman legions in 9 CE, a sacred event in Nazi mythology. Himmler undertook an expensive renovation of the castle. A number of rooms were named after Germanic military heroes from the deep past, such as King Arthur, Henry the Lion, and Frederick the Great. The castle was also decorated with mysterious pagan runes. Himmler earnestly believed that when the Nazis secured domination over the world, the castle and its assorted artifacts would pulsate with palpable spiritual energy. Himmler threw himself into acquiring artifacts such as the Holy Lance, the spear that the Roman soldier Longinus plunged into the side of the dead Christ. Hitler even believed that such relics could reveal the future. Himmler established some sort of ritual structure resembling baptism at Wevelsburg, although the specifics of the rituals themselves are opaque. Like much of the rituals and general pageantry of the Third Reich, the ones at Wevelsburg were probably an incoherent mixture of Christian and pagan practices. The basement of Wevelsburg even featured a crematorium for heroes of the SS. In late March of 1945, with the US Army only days away, Himmler decided to have Castle Wevelsburg destroyed. Restoration efforts on the castle began in 1973, and today the castle is a museum and hostel. Himmler was not the only Nazi higher up to embrace a strange mixture of fringe science and religion. Deputy Führer Rudolf Hess promoted a number of pseudoscientific medical practices. And in May 1941, a little over a month before Nazi Germany's monumental invasion of the Soviet Union, Hess made an unsanctioned flight to Scotland after consulting an astrologer. He was captured by a local home guard unit, imprisoned, and eventually tried and convicted of crimes against humanity at the Nuremberg Trials. Joseph Goebbels' infamous propaganda ministry hired a team of astrologers to obtain military secrets from the Allies. And Hitler himself promoted the long discredited World Ice Doctrine, which claimed that a series of icy celestial objects collided with the ancient Earth and spurred on the development of human culture. As the Nazis began to lose the war, their magical thinking only grew more intense and unhinged. With destruction appearing all but inevitable, many Nazis hoped that some miraculous weapon or Wunderwaffe would save them. In September of 1943, Himmler appointed SS Obergruppenführer Hans Kammler as the director of the Third Reich's top secret weapons program. Kammler, whose previous work included coordinating the construction of the cremation facilities at Auschwitz, was tasked with overseeing research on anti-gravity machines, 
in the notorious Nazi rocket program, which would go on to produce the much-feared V-2. Kammler's most ambitious project was an anti-gravity instrument known as Die Glocke, or the Bell. Nothing definitive is known about this bizarre device, and it is unlikely that it ever came to fruition. In 2000, Polish journalist Igor Witkowski broke the story on Die Glocke, basing his claims on Polish intelligence extracted from Jakob Spurenberg, a middle-aged SS officer. Spurenberg maintained that a sizable number of Nazi scientists and unfortunate test subjects died between 1944 and 1945, working on a bell-shaped anti-gravity machine at a secret facility along the Czech border. The bell was supposedly intended to be quite large, somewhere between 12 and 15 feet high, or 4 to 5 meters, for the rest of the world. It was to be powered by a series of rotating cylinders that would be filled with a mysterious fluid codenamed Serum 525. Spurenberg alleged that the fluid was volatile and had to be kept in special containment vessels. The work of physicist Victor Schauberger, himself an esotericist, was apparently influential on the Die Glocke team. Schauberger was famous for studies on the ecology of forest and waterways. He believed that the biosphere was suffused with spiritual energy that could be harnessed. In 1934, Albert Peach, a titan of industry and the head of Nazi Germany's economic chamber, arranged a meeting between Schauberger and Hitler. Hitler, in a moment of deep clarity, suspected Schauberger of being a fraud and refused to meet him again. In 1944, with the Allies in complete control of the war, Himmler met with Schroeder Strans, a young Luftwaffe officer who had, a few years earlier, attempted to convince the Luftwaffe to develop his death ray device, Strahlengrata. Strahlengrata was intended to be an anti-aircraft weapon. Minister of Armaments and War Production Albert Speer was skeptical of the project and urged Hitler not to fund it. Himmler and Schroeder Strans doubled down and claimed that Stalingrada could be used to probe the Earth for oil reserves, an invaluable resource for energy-starved Germany. The project was approved. Later that year, the engineering firm Elemag Hildesheim presented Himmler with the schematics on a weapon that would use the particles in Earth's atmosphere to generate lightning that could be directed at enemy forces. Nazi higher-ups were enthused about this project in part because of its resonance with Germanic folklore. Lightning was a potent symbol of power and domination. It was associated with Thor, perhaps the most prominent and mighty god in Germanic paganism. There was such widespread belief in the reality of Germanic paganism that the Nazis erected electrical transmitters at ancient sites such as Brocken. Werewolves also featured heavily in Nazi mythology. Working in the immediate aftermath of the war, Austrian historian Robert Eisler argued that a belief in lycanthropy, which was widespread in medieval and ancient Germany, was revived by the Third Reich. For instance, Nazi higher-ups used the word werewolf to describe the animal tenaciousness of the German military. But it gets much weirder. In 1941, Abwehr, the German intelligence service, started a spy training group codenamed Werewolf. Two years later, Heinrich Himmler and Odilo Globochnik began what was in essence a colonial project that would involve the movement of Germans into Soviet Ukraine. The project was called Werewolf. In the final grueling months of the war, as the Allies tallied victory after victory, Hitler and Goebbels formed the werewolf movement, a partisan insurgency that targeted the Allies and any Germans who collaborated with them. Few Germans joined the movement, as most were aware of the futility of such an undertaking. The werewolves appeared to have had the most success in areas where ethnic Germans were a minority, including the Sudetenland, Silesia, and South Tyrol. Here the werewolves were able to legitimize themselves in part due to the overwhelming fear of the advancing Soviets, 
who were exacting a brutal revenge against their invaders. This peculiar blending of science, religion, and occult mysticism was fomented in part by the traumas of World War I and the instability of the Weimar Republic. In the words of historian Conrad Haydn, the German state of mind in the interwar period was vulnerable to a man who became their flag and fire, who towered above them and illuminated them, who with magic eloquence expressed what they thought. The mystic spell that Hitler cast over millions and millions has been compared with hypnotism, and as an analogy may be apt, at least mental compliance is a prerequisite to being hypnotized, no matter how hidden that compliance may be. The Nazis, with their invocation of a spiritualized science in the service of nationalism, were uniquely equipped to capture the imagination of a battered and desperate German people. I hope you enjoyed this video. Be sure to like and subscribe and leave feedback in the comments below. Any feedback is especially appreciated now, as this is Marginalia's first video. Thank you.